The subject of this morning, I think, can best be summarized in the thought given by Plato in the fact that the purpose of philosophy is to build a solid foundation under faith. There is no substance to philosophy except that it be a servant strengthening our convictions of things beyond itself. In the Kabbalah there are 50 gates. 49 gates can be repassed by mortals, but the 50th gate, which is the final union with reality, is not an intellectual experience. It is something that we have termed faith. Now, faith is not just believing. We have many people who have wonderful beliefs, and in some cases those beliefs constitute faith, but not always. Because faith must have a substance. Faith must have beneath it and around it something by which it is justified. The individual, particularly in these days, is not as an easy believer he will not be able to simply assume a faith. And though he may accept it, and though he may enter a church and be uh, baptized into a sect, this does not constitute faith. Faith is an inward experience of eternal value. The ancients trichotomized the search for truth, dividing it into religion, philosophy, and science. In the modern world, we have eliminated, more or less, the philosophical factor and have simply coined the two terms, science and religion, to represent the major divisions of human knowledge. This is a mistake. Even the dichotomy is wrong. There are no divisions. As long as one form of learning is separated from another, there will be conflict. As long as there is conflict, there is no perfect faith. Faith must not be divided. We cannot have believers and unbelievers. And the purpose of philosophy is to eliminate the intervals between forms of learning in order that they may all support the one important thing, ultimate faith. Faith in its finest and fullest expression is the complete experience of the awareness of the eternity of the divine plan. Faith is that which makes obvious to all of us the sovereign power that governs all things. Now this sovereign power has always been there and has been considered for ages, but we have built away from it. We accept its reality, but we seldom involve it in our thinking or in our daily experiences. It is not very frequently that we recognize in the phenomenal world the evidences of the noumenal plan of things. So that actually all forms of knowledge exist only for one purpose, to reveal the essential nature of themselves. And when they do this, they reveal that their eternal nature is one with the divine. In other words, we do not stop in the study of anatomy with the dissection of the body. We do not end art with a fine painting. We do more or less as the Zen masters in Japan did. They remain very quiet and let reality paint through them. They were not artists in their own right. They were agents of an eternal artistic instinct in the universe. Faith is a more or less complete instinct in the universe as far as we can explore it. And yet we seldom consider these things. We get a late, a late bulletin from some scientific institution that proudly announces a new cure for asthma. Well, that is important. There's no question about it. But very seldom does this announcement mean that a really real understanding of sickness is available or that we have achieved the final recognition that every part of diagnosis is actually a fragment of the diagnosis of truth. Every symptom 
is part of a recognition of a divine plan and a divine purpose. Everything good and bad bears witness to one reality. What we call bad is usually that to which we are not willing to contribute or support. We believe that bad is what we do not want, but may bitterly and deeply need. So we have now to look at faith in the eyes and in the concepts of searching in every known branch of knowledge for the root of itself. And wherever we find the root, we find ourselves in the presence of an infinite wisdom and infinite manifestation. We suddenly realize that the ordinary worker is working under a law that is eternal. The craftsman, the artist, the professional person, all are servants of some aspect of reality. And the many aspects of reality are all rooted in one eternal principle. Therefore, advancement in any form of knowledge is an advancement toward the one reality. Now, this one reality, it can be accepted. Many people accept it. Many people believe in it. But very few people have experienced it. Very few individuals have become increasingly aware of the divine purpose they are more apt to be increasingly aware of the human need. But the human need is only one aspect of the divine purpose. Therefore, Plato was very right in attributing uh, to all forms of learning that they were all servants of truth. And truth itself is a term applied to faith. All of our learning is a kind of sacred learning. Even our most secular institutions are parts of a divine plan. Every building, home, house, office building, station, airport, each one of these is a house of truth. In some mysterious way, it is fulfilling a law. It is revealing through its own structure the skills of human minds. And these minds, in turn, are rooted in the divine mind. So everything that happens in the world is sacred. Everything that we try to do is inspired by some degree of insight into something greater than ourselves. Yet most persons do not explore these things. They do not consider them. They live merely on the surface of success and failure. They live their own lives, and in this particular period of civilization, the absence of foundations is becoming more and more obvious. We are losing the reality of experience. Experience is nothing if it doesn't teach us something. If experience only makes us angry at each other, makes us condemn the world in which we live, or gives us the feeling that we're entitled to exploit each other, if these are the things we experience, we have failed completely to carry forward the purposes of a universal, infinite program. We have to do the thing that is right. And even the smallest thing, the smallest kindness, is an expression of an infinite faith. We do not know it as faith. Maybe it only gratifies our emotions to do something kind or say a kindly word. But these kindly things are an expression of a deep-rooted faith. They are like the gold in base rock. They are the veins of reality in a world of illusions. So when uh, we approach the problem of faith, we are m much concerned with trying to understand how to increase faith. Well, all forms of knowledge is ba are based upon something. Mathematics is an exact science. Astronomy is an exact science. Medicine is an exact science. All of these, therefore, to the degree that they are true, should contribute to our experience of faith. But they do not in most cases. We are developing now a form of healing which is largely involved in believing or in faith. 
but in order to have the strengthening of faith so that it can overcome the limitations of flesh, time, and circumstances. We have to do as Lord Bacon pointed out. We have to use a threefold structure, another a tri a triad, another triotomy of values. He called these things tradition, experience, and experimentation. These are the instruments to find out what is true. And that, when found, is to answers the question, what is faith? Faith is therefore based upon the true experience of everything that happens. It is based upon the infinite variety of opportunities to learn. And we can learn anything from computers up and down. But the purpose of it in the all in the end is one thing, to build a solid foundation under faith. Faith is the only part of our lives that can sustain us in all of the emergencies of existence. Faith is something so infinitely and eternally a present in our computations of things that we have to understand it. Faith not only is a believing, but it is a strength. It is that power within ourselves which, when strengthened, makes us greater than circumstance. Faith continues to support virtue in the presence of testing, trial, and discouragement. Faith, therefore, is man's internal strength. It is to his inner life what success or advantage or wealth may be to his outer life. The individual may be strong in wealth and weak in faith, and his life will be visible. We abuse things that we do not understand. Abuse arises from ignorance. That ignorance is not necessarily the fact that we cannot read and write. Ignorance is the fact that we have not discovered the truth at the root of life. Then that truth is absolute integrity. And as long as we compromise that, we will doubt the existence of God, and we may even do as some are now doing, believe in the existence of evil. Evil is not really a thing in itself. It is simply a lack. It is an emptiness where there should be a fullness. It is a compromise because principles are not strong enough to dominate the life of the person. So in faith we are constantly working for the inward experience. But the inward experience alone can lead not necessarily to faith but to fanaticism. It can lead to all kinds of extreme beliefs and doctrines and ideas that no, have no substance in integrity. Therefore we have to prove faith. We have to use the instruments by which we can discover the absolute integrity of space and faith. And we do this through history. We do it through all the sciences. We discover the exactitudes of mathematics. And we realize that they are there for something more important than counting bonds and, and profits. We can know the facts of astronomy, but there is much more we must know about the universe than the number and the positions of the planets and the number of holes in space. We know definitely that healing is part of this great principle, but we are still struggling with various imperfect methods, and when we have a small discovery, we feel tremendously elated. But all of these things are actually ways by which we can explore the sublime manifestation of existence, which is present in everything. We may talk all we want to and invent all we want to, but we cannot create that which arises in nature or arises in an inward life of things. We can plant the seed and grow the bush, but we cannot finally create the life that is in within that seed. We can have all kinds of happiness and all kinds of misery, but behind all of these moods there is either a strengthening of faith or a weakening of it. Now, uh, Pythagoras and uh, most of the Greeks like to think of the search for faith under such headings as astronomy, mathematics, and music. They chose these because of the exactitudes, but they went to carry on the thought of the exactitude of existence. Actually, existence is completely lawful. 
It is completely benevolent and it is designed to achieve the perfection of all that exists. But these great virtues are not immediately obvious to us. Sometimes we have to learn how to live by the experiences of dying. And that is why reincarnation plays a very important part in our philosophy of life. It, is, it takes away some of the unanswerable questions that plagued our ancestors. It gives us one more step towards the realization of a completely honest and perfect universe. It reminds us, as all things do, today we are in trouble everywhere because we have ignored the laws and have failed to keep the faith. This little planet on which we live is a very beautiful thing. It is a wonderful thing and it is keeping faith with truth because it can do nothing else. It is one of the infinite manifestations of infinite good. But we living on this planet are getting into all kinds of troubles, largely because we are advancing knowledge but are not advancing understanding. We are becoming more skillful all the time but less virtuous. We are becoming richer but less happy. And as we gradually go along, we find our own misdeeds are responsible for the miseries which we would like to attribute to someone else. So here we are on this little planet where we could all learn a great deal, but we are so concerned with trying to handle the difficulties we ourselves have caused that we have no time to realize that these difficulties are in most instances obviously, obviously proofs of the eternal justice of life. In other words, these difficulties are not because the laws are bad, but because the breaking of them is bad. The divine plan is not filled with evil and suffering. But the breaking of it is a cause of evil and suffering. So we have today lost the beauty of faith. We have lost the quietude and the sublimity of knowing that we live in a universe of peace unless we disrupt it. See, the troubles that we have are not pouring down upon us from space. They are coming out of our own mistakes. They are the just consequences of our own misdoings. Therefore, there is no remedy for them but to correct the mistake. And this correction of mistake is the reason why the problems are here. To correct them is part of an eternal growth towards an eternal understanding of value. We are part of a universe which is founded in reality. We are part of a great plan that is immutable and about which we can do nothing. We can disobey for a time, but the plan gradually brings us back. We cannot violate the universal purpose and be happy, secure, or well established in any field of activity. So we are looking now for this proof of faith. We say that deity is in everything. Well, one of the first duties of faith is to find that, to come to the inward understanding of the fact that the looking upon the commonplace, we are seeing the face of God, that the sky and the birds and the earth and the flowers and the trees are all evidences of an eternal reality. So we study trees, but we study largely the type which we have named ourselves, we decide how long we can hold the timber before we have to cut it down to make something else out of it. We keep right on studying the names of 500 trees, where they grow and what of it. But the mystery of tree remains unsolved. The mystery of the fact of itself, its place as a manifestation of an eternal plan. The tree is a letter in an infinite alphabet which spells out all the truths we seek to know. So in everything that we do and everything that we come upon in the divorce of the day, we need to begin the study of the truth of it. And in studying the truth of it, the ancients, who were not as well equipped as we are for scientific matters, used philosophy. Philosophy was an effort primarily 
to find the justice in all things that happen. That means to find the reality of why those things have to happen. And if we find this reality, we strengthen faith because we come closer and closer to a universe that is without weakness or shortcoming. Every time we see the fairness of a thing, we vindicate God. Every time we find unfairness in things, we condemn ourselves. So every form of knowledge, by means of which we come closer to a real realization of the magnificence of life, every such form of knowledge strengthens faith. Now the ancients used philosophy as the instrument and made philosophy the handmaiden of faith. Plato so often and so correctly stated that all knowledge must lead to faith or it is false. Philosophy is not an end. It is a means. It is a road that leads. Science is not an end. It is, it is a means of exploring deeper into the mystery of the divine purpose. Yet in all these fields, this point is overlooked, forgotten, or ignored. One of the reasons why it is ignored is because it interferes with the right of the average person to make mistakes. It makes it difficult or we cannot find the justice of being wrong. And when we feel like being wrong, we do not want to be criticized for it. So instead of trying to correct the problem by self-improvement, we try to correct the problem by enforcing laws, which in themselves are merely means by which we seek to govern our own mistakes. But reality, as Pythagoras and Plato and Aristotle, all these great philosophers, realize, a reality is the thing we are seeking, and the reality is best established by the realization that everything is exactly as it ought to be except in our attitudes in which we have tried to ape the mystical symbolism of the fallen angels. The individual who tries to live contrary to the divine purpose is one of the foreign fallen angels. He is one of those that has divided itself from the realities of existence. Jacob Bamey, the mystic, makes this point very, very clear that we either belong to the good or we are perverting the good. Either we are doing that which is eternally right or we are trying to get along by doing things that are temporally, temporally partly right. We do not dare to face the actual problems that lead to faith. Now faith is a quieting thing. Faith does not go out to convert people. Faith is actually an inner experience. And it comes only to the individual who is able to control his own attitudes sufficiently to enable him to examine himself quietly, peacefully, thoughtfully, and regularly. The, the actual problem of faith, therefore, calls for common sense. The uneducated person has difficulty in faith because while he may believe and while he may claim to believe, he has no proof. He has no proof because his only inner believing is in his mind or in his emotions. He must therefore gradually achieve uh, what uh, Bacon refers to as experimentation. He must test his own convictions. He must find various ways of proving from things around him the facts about things inside of him. He must gradually, day by day, year by year, and sometimes life by life, understand the experiences which he inherits with each embodiment. He must always be on the alert to find out something that strengthens his knowledge that the universe is right. And also that the universe will continue to be right and will not be compromised by any action of any living thing. When the individual raises his hands against heaven, it is his hands that fail, not heaven. There must always be the immutable reality. And this is the thing faith seeks to find. And faith is the actual experience or experimentation with knowledge, with realities. 
The history of philosophy is a history of the unfolding of faith. As long as, however, we consider it the story of schools of thought, and they are irreconcilable, and are not possible to unite into un, uh, one unity. Unless philosophy is one, philosophy fails. Yet we have divided it into schools, trying to assume a competition in the realms of reality, that we can have one religion, and another man has another religion, and therefore there are two religions. This is not true. There's possibly only one religion, and neither of them has it. <laughs> and if there is one that has it, and they are equal, the other has it also. And the moment they both have it, they shake hands. While they do not have it, they kill each other. This is what we have in religion. It is a struggle for sur survival and supremacy on a level of spiritual ignorance. It is something that we are not willing to understand in its fullness. Every time we cut down a tree, every time we exhaust a resource of petroleum, every time we find a merger in which vast conglomerates come into existence, we are in the presence of danger, a presence of error. We are going against nature's edict that we do not own anything, not even our own souls. All things belong to one. The supreme power, which has the right to manifest through every creature, but it can never be stopped by any effort of the human being to prevent the free flow of enlightenment. Actually, therefore, all of these divisions are subject to modification, according to Bacon, in his uh, Novum Organum. It's necessary for us to discover to our utter astonishment and perhaps dismay that uh, the mathematics and painting and the sonata in music are all one thing. They are the same truth expressing in different ways. And unless they are the truth, then no, no progress is made because of them. The moment an artist believes himself to be a great genius, his art fails. When the artist himself prayerfully hopes to establish from within himself something of the beauty and wonder of life, then he is an artist. He is a great artist. And uh, if he is a great artist, there is no conflict between himself and any other artist. There is no conflict in language. Words and language give us a very bad time because we mistake words for meanings. And when someone says Allah, we do not believe it is God. We believe it is some heathen divinity. But there is no real heathen in the world except the individual who claims to know and doesn't. The individual who has not found the unity of God is the heathen not the individual who has discovered and united the various sects of life. Now, nature permits sectarianism for a time, but it shows us inevitably, step by step, how it fails. How one by one, all separateness leads to destruction. When we realize that, we are not sorry. We are happy. When we come to this kind of happiness, we begin to understand God. And when we understand God, we have faith. But as long as we believe in the things that cause misery, any term of faith is purely intellectual or emotional. It is not grounded in the personal experience of truth. And this personal experience is the thing that counts. Therefore, we have the problem of trying to find how to support faith. We could start in the kindergarten, or certainly the first grade in school, because faith is involved deeply with reading, writing, and arithmetic. And today all three of these have a tendency to be neglected. We do not believe much more in learning how to read and write because we expect to turn it all over to a computer. We expect to take it all from a TV screen. And you see the condition the television is in. It's a perfect example of not a bad human judgment, but of the failure of the human being to recognize the purpose of a great in potential educational instrument. The misuse by us is the cause of trouble. 
and it is the cause of trouble in every one of the great inventions that have come to us in the last hundred years. Every one of them has been abused. Each one of them is based upon a natural law or upon the discovery of forces, powers, and substances which abide in nature. These are there to be used. We have used them to abuse, and the result is our misery is magnified. This little planet, like Joseph's coat of many colors, is a mass of individual groups of people whose faith may be different from ours, but in most cases is not much worse than ours for the reason that our faith and their faith have not led us to the brotherhood of man. We are still fighting against the unbeliever or the disbeliever or the misbeliever. We are not trying to discover uh, by testing and going back to find out what the universe intended. We have not gone back in history or knowledge or to discover how one by one differences fail how one by one we are destroyed by our inconsistencies and we are also destroyed by our lack of brotherly love and fraternity. Yet we do not learn these things. We keep right on going, using the scientific answers as final, taking numbers to signify facts, when in reality behind it all is this wonderful all-living thing upon which we all depend. Every cell in our body depends upon something. We have never really found out what. We do not know how it is that the human being has become a human being. We can't manufacture one and will never be able to. Yet there is more intelligence, more consciousness, and more faith inside of the cells than we are able to manifest in our daily life. When cells are sick, they know it. When we are sick, we think it's just something that somebody else is trying to do to embarrass us. <laughs> we have no faith in medicine, or very little, because we find that the average physician is no longer bound by the Hippocratic Oath, is no longer devoted to the priestly tasks of preserving health, and because his vision has clouded, his therapies are inadequate. The only way he can come back again is to be the physician. And then being a physician, permit his body, his mind, and his conduct to be open, to be moved by the one physician that can cure all things. Until each of us finds a way to brotherly love and to service, the problems we have are not going to be solved. And they shouldn't be. This is not because the universe is, hot, is rough on us. This is not because we are victims of some divine conspiracy of gods in the background of things. These mistakes are simply due that we cannot learn or do not learn from experience. There is nothing that is happening to us today that is disagreeable that hasn't happened before. We are just a little bit more advanced in our skills, therefore our mistakes are more deadly. But we are still making the same mistakes but they were made long ago when somebody invented a bow and arrow. It's the same principle. And we haven't learned what to do since the bow and arrow game. We know that a lot of things have happened then, in weaponry particularly. But we advance weaponry as an evolving of a defensive art, when in reality is nothing more or less than a, an emergency effort to survive in the presence of our own mistakes. So we have a lot of things to think about in order to find out just exactly how we can develop a faith that is so strong that our own mistakes cannot shake it, that the world around us cannot cause us to misinterpret it, and that the whole together we will be able to unite for the purpose of making a world worth living in. And a world worth living in is what we had in the first place, but we didn't know how to keep it. Now it is obvious that we had to grow. Children have to grow. Parents have to help their children to grow. And in this case, we have one universal mystery that is the parent of all that exists. And the purpose of growth is to unfold the one universal reality in all of us. 
this reality is immutable it is unchangeable inevitable and the, the fact of this when it becomes obvious to us is the basis of the most enduring faith that is possible when we know that the laws are right that we are not shipwrecked on a desert island in space that we are not forgotten or ignored nor are we the results of cosmic accidents or family accidents we are really part of one growing totality we are flowers upon the tree of life and the one life lifes us all and gives us the strength and courage of survival as we gradually come to the exhaustion of selfishness because there's nothing left that we can be selfish about many of our problems will clear up but there's no need to wait that long we have the right to start this improvement immediately if we so desire all we have to do is look around us and find proof of the divine plan proof that is not spoken by other people truth that is not written in books but truth that is living in everything around us and within us every time we look out of a window every time we gaze down upon a bloody budding plant every time we look into the eyes of a newborn child we are in the presence of a kind of truth which is based in an infinite faith these things have to be they are right and they are not bad they are not dangerous they are not criminal they are not corrupt unless we do something to them and until we have faith that is strong enough to prevent us from the misuse of the values that have been entrusted to us and, and, and until then we are not going to find the answer of our problem but we must recognize that all things are beautiful unless we defame them all things are natural unless we make them abnormal everything is honest until we have given such precedence to dishonesty the whole generations have lived and died under that precedent all of these things we have to study and out of it all comes finally what Plato had a very gentle quietude a recognition that it is perfectly possible for the individual and for vast groups of human beings to grow into peace to leave behind forever the discords which now appear to be getting worse every day the time is very much here now and I think within the next few years we're going to see it vastly intensified we are going to recognize for the first time that we have outgrown an environment in which we can make mistakes and survive we are gradually coming to the realization that something is happening to the world and this thing that is happening is due to us this thing that is happening was not part of nature's plan originally but it was part of an education which was the only way to convert human minds and dedicate them to divine purposes we are finding more and more that we cannot survive by our present methods we cannot find proper places to put poison and material we cannot take care of our own refuse we cannot continue to work with the various natural resources which we have bitterly wasted we cannot continue to create congestion that pollutes the atmosphere we cannot continue to live under corruptions under narcotics and under these things which have nothing to do with nature's way but have obscured nature in a false manner the individual on narcotics for a minute feels as though he rules the world then comes the great collapse today nations believe that they rule the world they too are coming to the great collapse the individual believes he's right in everything and supports it with a couple of highballs that wears off and he suddenly discovers he's a sick person all these things are evidences coming more and more that we can no longer endure our own mistakes we can no longer live with a world in which everyone is doing things poorly we cannot live in a world in which progress means to conquer somebody else or in a world in which wealth means to take everything away from one group and bestow it upon another 
Wealth in itself is an illusion. Study wealth. Study down through the history of wealth and you'll come in the end to the love of God. You will find that all these things prove ultimately that deity is not in favor of wealth. That these things are man's misjudgments. If you want to find power, you will find power leading inevitably to the grave. Every false value we have is defeated by death, yet we have, learned not, we have not learned how to live. We haven't realized that by living a little different, differently we could face the future with a good hope. But we do not have these ideas. Everything now is locked within wealth, power, fame, prosperity, and the power to exploit each other. So, the, these things look as though maybe that God doesn't like us. Maybe it means that faith was false. Faith wasn't false, but we put ourselves in the position of believing in something that was not true. And we have no strength for that belief. We have no proof whatsoever that a highly industrialized civilization has a better chance of survival. We have none of these things. We know that we are moving inevitably toward bankruptcy, as just as the narcotics addict knows that he is shortening his life, and then maybe for a few moments exaltation, he will pay with a suffering and death. This is our present uh, pattern of things. This is the winter of our discontent. And it's coming in on us all the time. Instead of, however, making us skeptical and making us rebellious against life, it should prove to us that from the beginning and all the way along, right has always been right. It has never changed. Laws made of my man can be changed every day. Universal laws can never be changed. Because these laws make possible the growth of worlds. These laws sustain the galaxies. These laws also take care of the internal functions of the human body. These laws are in every ant, every, every little creature that lives, every flower, every bird. All of these creatures are manifesting one universal purpose, growth. And that growth is advanced step by step until finally it reaches the state in which it produces intellect, which it makes mind, by which the individual can take over and advance his own growth. The tendency has been, however, to use this mind to evade and avoid responsibility, to do anything except dedicate it to a purpose which is necessary. And we have a great many schools of thought that have sustained our mistakes. Most of our educational system has not yet even begun to experience the need for faith. It hasn't realized that all this education we are handing out can lead to only further tragedy unless it is dedicated, unless it is de devoted to the advancement of eternal purposes, all of our wisdom is in vain. Therefore, we need more and more to recognize that all education must lead to faith. All inventions must lead to faith. For in each of these inventions, and in each of these structures, there is a universal law working. We are misusing that law, using it purely for mechanical or materialistic purposes. And because of the abuse of the law, it turns upon us. Not because the law is wrong, but because we have deceived and perverted the law. But everything we do, from the shopkeeper to the greengrocer to the banker, the doctor, the lawyer, all peoples are founded in universal principles based upon universal integrities. And as the individuals are no longer trained in these integrities, we have the problems we have today. I remember many years ago a great stew that was raised against the Asclepian Earth in connection with medicine. That no one wanted to, to, get, to swear that they would use healing primarily for the common good. There was a little element of profit in it somewhere that had to be emphasized and the code had to be rewritten to allow it. Well, 
It don't make any difference how it doesn't make any difference how we rewrite anything. The infinite plan goes on. The Escalipiads of old were priests of the temple. They were a family descended from the gods. They had their own ideals, their own dreams, and their own purposes. And they served as a priesthood the needs of the sick. It was in Rome that medicine was secularized for the first time, and within five years a whole group of laws had to be enacted to prevent malpractice. Up to that time no such laws were necessary. Where there's no profit, there's not much malpractice. But uh, we have forgotten that the glory of help, the glory of helping those who are in need, is, is part of a basic religion. And without this basic religion tempering all our conduct, we will always have mis mistakes and misfortunes to labor from. So we have to think very definitely that the miseries we're in right now are the strongest inducements to the attainment of faith that anything could happen to us. Now is the time when the need for faith means that we have to have something to live for besides the privilege of exploiting each other. Those days are gone. And yet the individual without faith and without ideals, if he is deprived of his physical advantages, is going to be very unhappy. In fact, in his ignorance, he may turn upon those who are his benefactors. The exploitation principle is now deeply enmeshed in human character. But it, no, it doesn't make any difference how deeply it is there. It will not succeed and it must inevitably fail. So we have to work together now to see how to do something about this. I think probably most people have some interest. Maybe one individual likes to paint and another one likes to go out and wander in the woods. Uh, someone likes to sit quietly and read, and a few, unfortunately, enjoy murder on television. But uh, the actual fact of the matter is we've got to start with what assets we have. And our assets are our needs and the gradual realization of those needs. We have to build upon whatever talent is available. If you're a musician, that is your talent. If you're a poet, that is your talent. A photographer, the same. Now this talent must tell something to you. The talent is not simply that you can make a picture that can sell or write a piece of music that can be sold. All these things bear witness to one point, that there is a creativity within yourself. And that this creativity within yourself can be unfolded, enriched, until it becomes the scientific foundation for your faith. Upon the evidence of your own sensory perceptions, upon the evidence of the accomplishments of certain practices through, to, through effort, through struggle, you gradually come to the realization that faith is something that is founded upon achievement, founded upon proof, and the proof of faith is that you yourself are happier. It is the faith that will relieve you of the false values which will continue to curse you as long as you live unless you do something about them. Now in schools of learning, therefore, every university should realize that regardless of what it thinks about itself or knows about itself, it is actually a church. Because anything from the language up, from the alphabet on, has sacred significance. Every art and science that is given carries with it moral responsibilities. And if these are not accepted and assumed, if these are not recognized and taught, the education will produce a group of highly schooled rascals whom we'll have to live with in spite of our miseries. It is necessary, therefore, that the university, not necessary that it builds a chapel on the college grounds, that was one of the problems that faced University of Chicago. Nearly every rich individual who died uh, with a bad conscience wanted to donate another chapel to the university grounds <laughs> until they had all the chapels they wanted. But what one of the professors told me what they were looking for was nuclear equipment. They were right in the first place. The actual fact of the matter is 
that every school from the kindergarten on has to be part of bringing the individual to the maturity necessary to enable him to prove so conclusively the integrities of life that he loses all interest in breaking them down. He knows before he starts that there is nothing but misery. He pretty well knows that today. But he hasn't changed his own inner life. He always thinks of himself as the one dishonest person who is going to survive. Even if he survives, it means nothing. Because nothing that he has done is significant to himself or anyone else. The poor standard of homes, all the different difficulties that are coming out socially are the result of misuse of values. They are the perversion of things by nature right and good. They are the exploitation or commercializing of things which were intended for common use. So the school has to have it. There's no need for a theological education. There is no need of combating or the idea of converting individuals to one sect or another. These are all more or less superstitions. Sectarianism is a form of error. If it is held that way, but an individual who has outgrown it knows why it exists and therefore does not attempt to abuse anyone because of his origin or his beliefs. But we are working toward something that we have to find, and that is somewhere every scientist is looking for facts. Facts are the physical shadows of truths. Now we are not only satisfied with that, but in the days ahead, we must gradually ascend from facts to realities. And finally, from realities we come into the presence of that all-powerful, inevitable reality which we approach with faith. We know that that reality cannot fail. We know that that reality is absolutely just. We know that all of our mistakes are the mistakes of children. When we correct the mistakes, we will be promptly forgiven. What we must make some move towards reconciling personal conduct with that which is universal morality. We can't keep on breaking every rule and expecting the next administration to take care of it. There is no political system in the world that really can convert an individual who is dedicated to self-centeredness and selfishness. He will get into power and he and the world suffer together. So we need to begin in the, sco in the schools. We need the children to uh, do what they did for a number of years in Japan in all the schools. I think they probably are becoming so industrialized now, they probably will forget it also. But the grammar school grading you know, 30 years ago was, for the school, ethics, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Ethics first. In the high school, it was ethics first. In the universities, it was ethics first. And we should need a little of it over here. We should have ethics as part of education. We should have the right to be right manifested, supported, and rewarded. We should have the knowledge before we get into higher education that all education is dedication. And that without dedication, education is meaningless. The individual who gets educated only to work for a few years till he can retire on a pension, this is part of a cycle of death that leads nowhere. Yet each of us has within himself or herself the power to think through things, to rise above temporality, to accomplish that which is necessary. But for some reason we are in a state of inertia. Maybe it is a problem of stress. But we were the ones that created the stress. It was not something that was wished upon us by heaven. There is nothing here that we have created that is a trouble to us that was not created by a power within ourselves which was given to us to do things well. We have disused the faculties and skills that we have. We have advanced the skills but not the dedications. 
we know more about things than we ever did before and less about that one thing which we have vacantly and abstractly called truth. So we have this problem now all the time that we've got to find something firm enough that it can act as a foundation for further your growth. We've got to have something we can fall back on. Something that can come out and help when everything else fails. Something that is stronger than any uncertainty, more enduring than any problem, and more rewarding than any temporal activity. We've got to build faith in reality. Faith in truth. We've got to learn to know that if we keep the faith, the faith will keep us. When we break faith with faith, we are in great trouble. So many, many today we have many religious groups that are working in these directions, working for new ways of overcoming or transmuting the mistakes that have brought with them the tragedies of recent years. We are trying now to build into civilization principles that will endure. And yet the majority of humanity is simply unaware of these principles or unaware that they are necessary. To most people, any frustration of their right to be selfish is a disaster. And they will defend their own mistakes to the bitter end. And if necessary, will perform all kinds of evil and commit many crimes in order not to correct their own mistake. This will not function very much longer. Uh, we have told that the atmosphere is dangerously polluted. We are warned of volcanic disorders of one kind or another. We are warned of economic and uh, disasters, of health disasters, of the exhaustion of natural resources. We are warned that within a hundred years our population will be too great to endure on a little planet like this under the rules that now prevail. So population growth itself must result in a change of rules. No matter how we view the future, we are in trouble. We have wasted a large part of our birthright. We have destroyed the very source of our own securities. So we have to try to rebuild. But we will not rebuild unless we have some faith in something more important than the mistakes we are making. We must build for a future because we believe in a future. We must save our various values and our natural abilities because we believe that they are important. We must do everything that we can to conserve resources even though we might like to spend it all today. Actually, as you look around, the whole world is in trouble all on account of the types of mistakes it is making. I don't think anyone is really greatly in trouble because a nation did it well. Nearly every problem has been abused and exploited. And we are falling back on the idea of violence to solve ignorance. And violence can never solve ignorance. The only thing that can solve ignorance is wisdom. But wisdom in itself is, can be worldly wisdom. There are many very capable and interesting intellectuals who are known to have considerable worldly wisdom. This won't do it. No matter how much wisdom we have, we have nothing if we do not have love. And when we have love combined with wisdom, we have faith. Something has to have happened to bring us back to this new childhood, this new kind of a world that we are going to get into one of these days, a world in which we are all going to start again and come back to a better kind of globe than we have ever known before. But to do this, we all have to start learning. Maybe we won't learn it all in this life, probably won't but we can be a little better prepared for the ones that must come after us and ourselves when that time comes there is great talk going around about the probabilities of a major change in human affairs at the beginning of the next century that that is about as long as what we're doing now can hold up 
Well, I sometimes wonder if it's going to hold up that long. But certainly there will be changes. And everyone indicates that the changes they want are good changes. But when the time comes, most of these people are going to be talked out of it. They're going to go fall back on the idea that they can appoint a guardian to take care of them. That some social group or some individual can lead them to the promised land. Up to the present time, uh, no one has been too successful in that. Even Moses was not permitted to go into the promised land himself. He showed the way, but he could not go in. And it is the same way with all these different problems that we face. The, we cannot depend upon individuals to protect us from ourselves. I think the Oriental has a very good view on this particular problem. Perhaps the Zen masters are among those most talented. They have recognized the sovereign value of a pre brief period of time each day devoted to faith. That in a world that is busy with everything you can think of, and a world that wastes hours and hours a day on various poor programs and entertainment, the individual feels that they have very little time in which they can think, or has very little entire interest in thinking. It's all a matter of social security and a job and uh, those types of things. And in the midst of it all, homes are falling apart, young people are becoming more and more restless and delinquent, and everything is going from bad to a little worse, and everybody is doing just as they always have. The Zen masters said that one of the first things to do is to set aside a little bit of time to the simple purpose of thinking. The Pythagoras advocated this and then the disciplines of retrospection and meditation, that the individual should at some time each day for five minutes or maybe even less, just a couple of minutes, think through things straight, even though he may not have the courage to do what he thinks. But if he thinks this way long enough and becomes more and more aware of the possibility of enriching his own life, the chances are that he will be impressed. One thing he will do that may impress him a little more than most things, he'll save a lot of money because we are now using a vast amount of money simply to forget ourselves because we can't stand ourselves we can't be quiet alone we become bored and practically hysterical or finally become under psychiatric care unless we have something to keep us busy every minute with trivia but if the individual could do a little thinking he can also find a judgment for it he can take something he wants to know that would be in the right direction. And you can use it for a few minutes every day. He can go back to a school in which he has learned to be the teacher himself. He can find the texts and works necessary to give him the next step of personal inspiration. If he just needs to join groups to do it, so fine. But if he is not inclined in that direction, he may do it himself. But to the Zen people, it is simply a problem of recognizing the importance of being still in order to know that there is no way of knowing while your frontal mind is busy uh, committing acrobatics where there is no way of uh, getting these insights you need if the brain is a haunted house it has to be something that is done in quietude we find usually that we can't even control our own thoughts let alone trying to control the world, we can't control ourselves. But little by little, we can increase this control. We can use the faculties we have to do something worthwhile. And in the Zen concept, silence becomes the doorway to faith. Silence becomes the means of gradually extricating the faculties from the, from the horrors and miseries of daily experience. Silence is peace, and the, beer, and the power of eternity abides in peace. Silence is a communion with the over-self or the all-self, and this communion can become the basis of a beautiful dedication, and this dedication is necessary 
to anyone who wants to live a little better in this confused world. So in the presence of the humdrum, and the worse than that, the discordant, there is the possibility of quietude. For in the quietude of things, we live in the universe as it was before man was invented. Or might we better say evolved. Where the universe was at peace until minds came in with the right to grow and make a better world. The uh, civilizations we know were laboratory experiments in the unfoldment of the potentials of human consciousness. They were ways in which we could show how much we knew. Instead of that, we have gradually become expert in showing how much we do not know through the constant mistakes that we make and have not the common sense or even decency to correct them. So nature has given us a, a very simple curriculum on how to do it. We can all do it. Every school of religion and important philosophy in the world has had its meditational life. It had its quietudes, had its efforts to search into the mysteries of first cause, had the infinite desire to find out the reason for existence. It has been assumed that that quest is vain. They will tell us that it can't be done, that there is no way of knowing. This is true if we try to use the outward methods. But internally there is always a road open. There is never a moment when the path inward cannot be found if we want it badly enough. The great problem is that we have not really sought for it. What we want to do is to go inward and at the same time be as prosperous as possible on the outside. And the combination of conflicts, the search for realities, and the code of life that cherishes unreality. The desire to be better but not give up anything about being worse. Always we're trying to dichotomize these things so that we can carry water on both shoulders. We can pray for benefits and at the same time abuse all of the laws and purposes of life. It becomes obvious that this isn't possible. And now we are beginning to see it. And for a long time, there wasn't much we could do about it if we did see it. The world was in, this, in slavery to very false systems that had been endured for long periods of time and which had to go. But now the average person has the right uh, to build something better. Our own country was created in, by men and women of vision who wanted to give this world a better place to live in. We have gradually mistaken the meanings of things. We have lost our true dedication to the integrities of our own systems of life. We must find them again and outgrow them and go on to something better. We cannot get rid of them, though, without outgrowing them. All progress is an upgrowing. There is not one step that is taken, which we call progress, that isn't merited by consciousness and conduct. These must work together to accomplish the purpose. And therefore, in our search for faith, we must earn it. We must need it. We must desire it. We must dedicate to it. And in doing it, we can be doing it very simply to start with. Just gradually become aware that there is a universe, that we are citizens of it, that we will always be citizens of it, unless we put ourselves in exile by our own mistakes. And no matter how bad the exile is, we will always return. The first step towards the correction of our own weaknesses is the first step towards union and joining in with universal realities. Faith is the only instrument we have. We have to make it strong. We have to do all that we can to strengthen its contribution. We must build into it every truth discovered by science, every bit of wisdom gathered by philosophers, all of the beauty given us by art, all the truths revealed through science. All of them are parts of the same faith. It is where we have taken the faith out of them that we have failed. We have assumed that we could unite the bodies without uniting the soul. We have believed that these arts and sciences are separate beings. They are not. They are merely the manifestations of one eternal principle. All of these things, every artist draws nothing but that which is in within himself. 
And if his drawings are rather strange, it's because he's rather strange. But in all matters, the, the inner life is the key. So we have to begin to work on this idea that nothing will live without faith. No merchant can succeed without faith. And faith is not in the faith of his product. It is the faith of his own character in the handling of his product. It is the wisdom and skill and conscience within himself that ultimately determines the success of his enterprise. So uh, I think for the average person, we start with something with faith. We can look around us in things that have already happened. We will find things we did well and we're glad of it. We will find things that we made mistakes and suffered the penalties. Also, we will be able to look around us in civilization and see others making the same mistakes and also making the same corrections. If we watch the corrections, then we are following uh, what Bacon called experimentation. Society has been experimenting with life for a long time. Science has been experimenting with life. And the only thing that science has really learned is that whatever it is, we're not doing it the right way. And having discovered that, we begin to search for the right way. And Bacon gave the Novum Organum or the new organ of learning. And an organ that it combined spiritual integrities with intellectual and physical facts. The proof of morality in the laboratory. The proof of philosophy in the, in the merchandising. The proof of wisdom in the commonplace. The proof of maturity in the child. The proof of fidelity in the home. All these things work out. And wherever the rules are broken, something is lost. And ultimately, one who breaks the rules must pay. So uh, faith is established on the realization that we live in an absolutely honest universe. And that there's nothing we can do about that except be honest ourselves or suffer. We are in a universe that has purpose. We don't know what our purpose is most of the time. We are in a universe that has a future and knows where it's going. We don't. But we can gradually develop a sufficient structure of facts available to us so that we can begin to trust a future because we know the principles and laws governing action and we have discovered some of their workings. It is perfectly possible for us to gradually and in reasonable time make the changes in ourselves. They, these changes may not all happen at once and uh, we may go out of this embodiment with these changes only partly made but that isn't important. Nothing is important because we're going to come back with the new changes and be that much further ahead. And because of what we learn now, those who are coming into birth a thousand years from now will be much wiser and better than we are because we are them and we are growing up. Growth is measured not in the cycle of a single embodiment, but in the terms of ages. And the progress continues as long as integrities grow within people. Now, there are going to be a lot of people go out of life this time without integrities. They must come back, too. We will have the trouble with them again. Death is a change of worlds, but not a change of character. Therefore, whatever we live by and die by, we will be reborn by. And in order to escape the difficulties that we are harassed with today, we must change ourselves so that when we return, those particular ills have been already corrected. In working these things out, there's a little common sense comes into it, and common sense is very good in helping with faith, because faith in a, some, in a mysterious way is the common sense. It is something that we instinctively know and carefully avoid. It is something that we believe in, but it interferes with other beliefs that are less important. So the problem is to get faith up front where it belongs. To get it to the point where it can give us the strength to face adversity and the courage and wisdom to build a better future. Individually we need it. Racially we need it. Nationally we need it. And for that matter we're not sure that the planet doesn't need it. Because we have been exploiting a planet 
that was given to us for a garden and have changed it into a garden of weeds. This has to be changed. There will be enough if we do it right. We can overcome all scarcity. We can carry with success twice the population of the the present planet and carry it decently if we stop being selfish, if we stop trying to exploit each other and realize that in the one great family loyalty to each must be achieved through loyalty to all. If we get all get loyal and get down and do the things that are necessary, we could have one of the prettiest planets that there ever was or ever will be. And we will be very much better off and rather happy in this planet doing the things that we ought to do. When that happens, we know that faith has come. Well, that's it, folks.